uh, you can park. You can, like, I can. All right. There, I can park. Walk up that way, so it's good. Great. Um, so thank you all for coming here this evening. As a reminder, we will also be we uh, recording this as well, so uh, people can watch afterwards. My name is Josh Mandel Bram. I'm a 2005 WashU graduate. And I'm very pleased to be here tonight to moderate tonight's panel, where we have four other alums who have really incredible stories to share. Um, first and foremost, I'll just go off script a little bit. Washi knows me well, and they wrote it down, probably because they think I'll mess it all up. But um, I'll start with the first part, which is all of you have some connection to WashU, either through alumni, through children, um, through other avenues. And that's great. I think we all share the common bond of feeling very privileged and um, honored to have gone to WashU and wanting to give back in different ways. And this is one way in which I think we can give back, that is biotech, healthcare, life sciences is becoming a very important area. It's always been one, but it's continuing to be very important, and we want to make sure WashU has an important place in that. And so sharing stories and connections is just one part of that, and um, I hope this is the start of more of these types of events. So I think giving feedback as well uh, at the end of the event is also very useful for Jim and Jenna and others. Uh, so the first thing I'll do is I'll introduce myself. Um, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. We have a few questions that uh, we put together, but also some of you sent some questions ahead. So we'll be pleased to share some of those. And then we'll be sure to leave some time at the end for other questions as we go. And then this will be followed by a uh, short reception at the end where people can have drinks and food and talk a little bit more. Last thing before I get going is to just thank Molly and Jacob for hosting us here in Flagship. Very kind of them. Believe it or not, it's hard to find space and, and great space. So thank you guys. We appreciate it. Great. So uh, as said, I'm Josh Mendel Brem. Um, I'm currently the CEO of a company called Camp 4 Therapeutics. We are a preclinical private stage company that is using antisense oligonucleotides to upregulate genes. And we're going after a whole range of genetic diseases. Prior to this, I was an entrepreneur at Polaris Partners, which invests in early stage biotech companies. And prior to that, I was at much bigger companies. I'm sure many people have heard of Biogen, Genzyme, Sanofi as well. Eric. Thanks, uh, Eric Furfine. I was undergraduate and got a bachelor's degree in chemistry in 1981, so I'm the old guy up here at <laughs> Wash U. Um, spent uh, a long time as a biotech executive now, uh, including uh, three companies for our gracious hosts, the flagship pioneering folks. Um, and I'm currently chief executive and scientific officer at a company called Mosaic Biosciences, which does drug discovery research for other people. Hi, Molly Gibson. Um, I did my PhD at WashU in, in the computational and systems biology program there. Graduated in 2015. Um, background is in uh, originally computer science, um, moved into biology at, at WashU. Um, and I've been working with Flagship ever since to build companies. So I'm a senior principal at Flagship, work in venture creation there, which essentially means that my job is to um, found, build, grow biotech companies. Um, so given, given my, my interest at the intersection of computer science and biology, a lot of those look like companies that, that use AI for interesting problems in biology. So one of the companies that I've been working on um, for the past five years has been uh, Generate Biomedicines, which is in this building. Um, and it's, it's applying AI to generate novel protein therapeutics. So instead of being able to discover a protein like you would normally do, like immunizing a mouse um, to get an antibody, we generate them in the computer, using a computer, go build and test them. So uh, the company's you know, grown over the last five years, about 270 people. Our first drugs are gonna go into to humans this year. So it's been, uh, been a lot of fun. Been a, been a fun journey. Awesome. Uh, Jason Glashow, uh, I'm glad Eric went first. Uh, class <laughs> of 89, uh, undergrad. And um, uh, my uh, story is a little bit different than uh, these guys who have a heavy science focus. Uh, I've been on the uh, communications, investor relations, advocacy side, uh, and we'll get into it a little bit, I think, as we go, but which is such a uh, critical part of this business as well. Uh, uh, so much of it is uh, creating an environment where companies can actually operate, and that's, you know, there is, there are a lot of issues, obviously, that affect uh, the life sciences, but more 
uh, there's a constant need for fundraising. There's a constant need to be a part of a community. There's a constant need to recruit people and to uh, always focus on uh, the reputation of the organization and ha the impact that it's going to have uh, for patients and, and society. And that's, that's a uh, uh, significant and uh, ever-growing part of, uh, I think, what these companies face. So um, that's me. We'll talk more about it. Everybody, Jake Rubens. Uh, Molly did uh, all the hard work in introducing what we do at Flagship. Um, I'm a senior principal there as well. Um, I was class of 2010 at WashU uh, undergrad. Came to Boston for grad school and got interested in entrepreneurship. That brought me to Flagship, um, where I've been building companies uh, ever since. Um, spent most of my time there on four different companies. First was a company called Sana Biotechnology, which uh, is developing cell and gene therapies for a variety of different therapeutic areas. Um, there, uh, that company today is about 500 people, publicly traded company, and hopefully bring its first drugs into people very, very soon. Um, more recently, I was the founding chief scientific officer of Tessera Therapeutics, which is in this building. Um, at Tessera, we're developing a new technology to engineer the genome that we call gene writing. It allows us to just deliver RNA into a cell, and by doing that, add genes to the genome or fundamentally rewrite the genes in the genome. Um, that company is about 350 people today. And then more recently, I've, I've helped start two quite early stage companies that are more like 10 to 20 people. Um, that are also based uh, here in Boston. Um, and yeah, looking forward to sharing more with you guys about my journey and how uh, WashU helped set me up for what I do today. Great. Uh, I'll just say that <clears throat> if you told me when I graduated in only 2005 that 10 years later I'd be starting companies and, and saying what Molly and Jake said, it, it would blow my mind. Um, so there's been a, a radically, for the better, different set of career paths that come out of being a biology or pre-med or you don't even need to be a biology major, but if you want to come into the biotech universe, let's say. So I think the first question goes to that, which is uh, let's talk a little bit about different career paths. Let's talk about being an operator, being an investor, but let's talk about being an entrepreneur, which in and of itself is, is a career path and um, you know what that looks and feels like and, and how you can think about that today. So Eric, maybe we'll just start with you. And you could talk, you made this comment when we spoke about being a little jealous at, at these career paths that are available today versus some while back. I, I, I am, and uh, I think it's a wonderful change that's happened in the world. You know, when I started in school, in my PhD, you know, the thought of being an entrepreneur just never even registered to me. It was not discussed, it was not talked about. Uh, I went kind of old school. Let's go into a big company. Let's learn the way of the world there. Then inch your way to earlier and earlier stage. Not that you can't start in early stage first, but you know, back when I was doing it, there weren't that many early stage companies. And you went to the big places. And then you worked your way into smaller places and more entrepreneurial settings. And I look now, and I, I think it's incredibly exciting and wonderful that people like Molly and Jake are coming out of school and saying, I can start a company too and start thinking about those kinds of things and be being encouraged to consider those kinds of things and bringing those ideas to, to that space. I, I think it's exciting. And, and I am a little jealous that, that I didn't have that, but I'm also happy with the way I, I ended up too. So. <laughs> and I think it's changed actually fairly rapidly. Um, you know, so I, I graduated with my PhD in 2015. And even at that time, uh, at WashU, uh, there was a lot of conversation around, well, well, don't you need a postdoc? Like, you know, shouldn't you do a postdoc? Um, and to me, I just, I knew academia wasn't my route. Like, I, I just knew that wasn't going to be the case. And that's what a postdoc to me meant, is that you would go into academia. Um, and so it was still even just kind of this, it was this new path. I think that's changing quite a bit. I think that's changing at WashU, it's changing you know, across the country. Um, but it's, it's a recent change. To, just to build on that, um, I didn't get into entrepreneurship because I wanted to uh, run a company or, or start a startup, um, which is why a lot of people end up getting into it. I think what I came to realize during grad school and what many people who become biotech entrepreneurs realize is that Startups are a really unique, unique place to do science. Um, in academia, it can be, so I don't know how many of you guys have been in academic research settings, but it can be really challenging to get enough funding for what you want to do, to collaborate with the people that you want to collaborate with, 
to move the projects quickly and to dream as big as dream dream as big as you want to dream. And um, that is actually what biotech startups are set up to do. They're set up to bring together people to work on big ideas, to put a lot of capital behind it, and to collaborate very openly. And um, I think that's a unique realization that a lot of people are beginning to have in biotech, which is why they're starting to join startups or actually start startups themselves. Yeah, that's really well put. I mean, I, I, I don't have the same uh, jealousy. I also don't have the same stress. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, for me, and I didn't. I, I didn't call it pain threshold. It, was, <laughs> it, is, it is extraordinary. Um, but I've worked for some uh, amazing uh, leaders. I was at. Uh, uh, Biogen, actually where I knew Josh, uh, for several years with uh, George Skangos. I worked for a couple of years uh, with uh, Stefan at Moderna. I worked uh, uh, most recently at a company called uh, Frequency Therapeutics. All wildly different stories. Um, and there is within that leadership a, you know, the possibility of going too far, uh, a possibility of saying, you're going to do more than you can ever possibly do. And uh, a lot of our job is to uh, put things into the right context to make sure that people have an opportunity to really understand the impact that you're going to make, why it's going to be important, but also why it's achievable and why it's necessary. And, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, coming through uh, WashU and thinking about what I was going to do, I remember seeing the arch in my rear view window and thinking, well, that's that's that. Um, it's just such a, it, it, if you want to be a part of something where you can continuously learn uh, being part of this life sciences cluster in uh, in Boston, Cambridge, Somerville now, is just, uh, Watertown, is uh, just remarkable and, and has endless possibilities and to do anything. I mean, it, it's really amazing. Yeah, I think uh, Jake makes, makes a nice point in that, you know, for many years people think of academia as being the ivory tower, the, the place you can go to, to follow your ideas and, and figure out where you want to create something that, and figure out something that, that no one knew before and just follow your, your brain and your heart. And in a lot of ways, and maybe I'm biased because I'm in the biotech industry, I feel like that's the ivory tower now that people do have huge ideas and that the things that any one individual thinks of in an academic setting or used to think of in an academic setting is really a relatively speaking small idea. It can turn into something big later. But a lot of the, the venture capitalists who found these companies and the people who work with them to do it have huge ideas that are really ivory tower-like ideas and they put together teams of people to do, these, to do these kinds of things, and you get to be part of that. It's, it's really fascinating, and this idea that you're doing something applied, and who wants to go to industry? I want to, I want to be on my own doing what I want to do, but that's not what biotech is anymore. Biotech, in fact, is the ivory tower, big ideas, and, and trying to pursue it. And sort of, to, to Jason's point, um, you know, you have to figure out a way to sell the story, and I have to say Flagship does a brilliant job of this and a few other VCs uh, in the area as well. But you know, you, you have to be able to present this vision of where you want to be, whatever, five, 10, whatever it is years from now, wouldn't the world be totally different and great if we could get here? And there is indeed a path, a viable, logical path on which to reach that. And you have to be able to tell that story. And I think that's part of the point that, that you were making as well. And I think we've learned to do that as entrepreneurs and, and uh, investors in early stage companies. You know, the funny thing about, about that, and it's a great point, is that in tech, that's what they do. People don't find it weird if you start a company to build some technology in tech. You look around at every famous tech company, it's somebody who dropped out of school to build their dream. It's only in biotech where people expect you to have a, an academic paper that you're building from. And it's, we really need to start thinking like, like they do in yeah, tech more. You're right. Yeah. So you're a, you're a recent grad, or you have a child that's a recent grad, and they want to go into the industry. And they come and they ask you, well, <clears throat> should I go work at Pfizer? Should I go start a company and work with uh, Flagship? Should I go be a venture capitalist? Should I be a banker? How do you answer that question for them? 
What, what advice do you give them in, in the context of different career paths? Uh, I think they're all great options. Um, and it, I guess when somebody asks me a question, I usually ask them one back. You know, what do you see yourself doing? You know, what, what kind of person are you? What sort of life do you want? Um, some people want something that is relatively narrowly focused so they can dig deep. Other people are more like, at least I think of myself, are jack of all trades and masters of none. And those people tend to be a better fit in, in biotech where you have to wear a lot of hats in early stages of companies. Um, we need both kinds of people. Um, and you have to decide sort of how you picture yourself and what you want to be doing. Um, and then you can find a path to do those things in one of those places that you mentioned. That's how I see it. Yeah, I think it's a lot about how you're driven. Honestly, yeah. what drives you? Um, you know, if, if you are really driven to build, to, to kind of figure things out from the ground up, like an entrepreneur type role makes a lot of sense. Some people, that doesn't drive them. They want to see, um, you know, something that's a little bit more mature. They want to be able to take something that exists and then make it better or, you know, expand on, on you know, some of the get closer to, to drug in the clinic or, or things like that. So it's it's a little bit more how, how you're driven and what what like makes you happy. Um, do you want to work in small teams? Do you want to work in a larger organization? Like similar to like probably when you thought about where you want to go to college. Do you want to go to a small college? Do you want to go to a big college? Will you succeed in large classes? <laughs> Will you succeed in small classes? There's like there's some similarities to that as well. Um, so right. it's a lot more about you than it is about the company, honestly, because they're all, like you said, great options. Yeah, yeah. I would just say that that uh, the bar is very high, and the reason why, not to scare everybody here, but the bar is very high, and the reason why the bar is very high is because the bar was kind of low not that long ago, and a lot of money went into a lot of companies that are no longer here, and uh, so you get people with the credentials of these guys uh, because you need uh, that level both of uh, the ability to think about what the business is going to be uh, but also have the science background to to pull it through and by the way when you're out raising money now the questions you're getting and that the questions that even the scientists get that sometimes they can't answer because they're getting asked by someone who, by the way, has another degree beyond what they have. So it's it's a it's a tough tough uh, uh, world out there, and it's become appropriately uh, it's become appropriately difficult. Now, it's also keeping a lot of companies that should be going public going public. There's a lot of other issues built in that just things need to wash out of the system before things normalize again. Uh, but they will. And uh, I think you're going to see some really amazing companies uh, come forward over the next, you know, five, ten years that are going to really last a long time. Yeah. I'll, I'll take the answer in a slightly different direction, which is because I don't have much to add on what they added, but which of those is the most secure jobs, jobs in an interesting perspective? And I think the canonical thinking would be that pharma is more secure than startup biotech. I'd argue startup biotech is a much more secure place to be because farmers are con constantly cutting departments, whole therapeutic areas with zero notice. And it's hard to find another job, another pharma in a therapeutic area, and one of them has just gotten out of it. There's such a vibrant, small startup biotech scene here that if you're able to get your foot in the door and start building that network of really talented other biotech startup scientists, one day you're going to see those people go off and be at other companies, and you'll have a really strong network and ask them, what are they doing? Why are they where they are today? Um, and so I actually think ultimately from a career longevity perspective, startup biotech may end up being a more secure place to be than, than is pharma. Yeah. You didn't ask about security, but I think that is something yeah, a lot of people have. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just add one, yeah. a slightly other different <laughs> view on this, which is um, you don't necessarily need security coming out of college. What I mean is you're supposed to screw up a little bit. Um, it's kind of the point, I think. And when are you supposed to stop screwing up? Well, I don't know. That, you know, ask my parents. But like, um, the, the, no, but I'm serious. That I think there's a ton of pressure 
on this generation. It's fascinating where I came out of college and I wanted to go play softball and drink beer. And my, you know, and I, kind of serious. And, um, and that, you know, now it's like, I, I'll have calls with people that will reach out and it's like, you know, if I don't get this right, that right, this right, by the time I'm this age, this won't happen for me. And I don't know if that's a really great thing. I think careers, I always tell people, are very, very long. Careers are long. And I think some, uh, unfortunately, as humans, you learn your best lessons through failures and the successes are really sweet. But so you're supposed to take risks. And um, I always admired people, to your point, Molly, that like knew what school they wanted to go to and what they wanted to do. I was not one of them. I, I knew I wanted to be in biology and life sciences. It took me a while to figure out I didn't want to get a PhD. It took me a while to figure out kind of where I wanted to be within this world. But that's me to the point about individualism. Um, some people are built ready to go and go build a company. And the good thing is there are networks and channels and opportunities to do that. Um, but I also think it's important to recognize that it's OK to screw some things up, make some mistakes, take some risks. The best time to do it is, I think, earlier in life, quite frankly. I'm not talking about going to jail. But like the, you, know, the, the best, you don't have a family yet. You're not really carrying some debt, but it's relative to you know, your earning potential as you go. So I, it's not to actually disagree with any of this. It's just to say the other side of it is risk taking and going to try something that you're not sure is outside of your comfort zone. The nice thing is there's all these opportunities to do that as well, which I which I think is really cool if you listen to this discussion too. Yeah, I think like that's that's one of the big things is that you know when when I came out of my PhD, I I knew I didn't want to go to academia, but that was essentially all I knew. <laughs> like, and uh, I didn't actually apply for a single job. Um, I how, how I just gave my CV to a bunch of people, and it turns <laughs> out that works really well. Like if you just start handing your CV to people, they'll hand it to the next person, they'll hand it to the next person, and eventually you're gonna start to get mm -hmm. contacts. Um, and and just try it. Like I think it's I think it's actually underestimated how many people get jobs that way versus mm -hmm. actually applying online. Um, and there's lots of things I was looking at from you know being like looking at larger companies like Genentech or even Google. Um, you know, to like the startup that was coming out of flagship that I had no idea what it was. It wasn't named uh, because <laughs> it was a number, <laughs> um, and I didn't even know what flagship was. Um, but I knew that like if I joined this company, I could make an impact. It was something scientifically I knew, but I didn't know anything about building companies. So I could bring an expertise, and then I could take a risk, and I could do it in an environment where if I wasn't successful, there were 10 other jobs like ready to ready to be had. So I think like it's about taking opportunity for, you know, when they come and not trying to plan for that opportunity because the opportunity is never there for it if you plan for it. Mm. Um, it's going to be there when you least expect it. Yeah. I think you, one other th or maybe two other things. One is, you know, when do you decide to go for your job? Like you know, when I I sort of knew I was going to go to get my get my bachelor's degree, get my PhD, do a postdoc, and you know, then look for a job. And I was, in some ways, like Molly, and saying like I didn't want to go into academia. I pretty much knew that for sure. I liked the idea of inventing drugs, and I wanted to be involved in that. But now, people sometimes ask me, you know, should I do a postdoc? And my answer is usually pro probably not because biotech is better than a postdoc. And sometimes they ask me, should I get a PhD? Sometimes we have people, bachelors and masters in the company, say, should I go back and get my PhD? And I'm like, depends how motivated you are to learn, because you can learn almost everything and probably more right here doing what you're doing than you can in your PhD. Uh. And it's just the world of biotech has become so advanced in its thinking and so innovative that you learn a lot of the same kind of ways to think that you might in school. And so you can do things earlier. And just a second point, sort of come back to, to Jake's point of security, which I think is a really good one, at least in this area, and it's probably true in other, um, you're not employed by Generate. You're not employed by whatever name your biotech company that exists. You're employed by Boston Cambridge Biotech. Mm. Because the moment that one doesn't work, if you're a good scientist, trust me, you will have another job. Yeah, 
we, we, want to add? I, I was just going to add on to that. It, we, I mean, we had some, um, you know, significant layoffs at my last company, and all of those people were working within weeks, and yeah. that's a not only that. I'm sure you help them find jobs. Hundred percent. Oh, well, yeah. that's the crazy thing. So, you know, the only uh, addendum I was going to add to your point about going to uh, a biotech versus a, a we, Josh and I were at a big farm, uh, big biotech, you know, Biogen. Biopharma. That big bio, <laughs> pharma, bio thing. It's not becoming pharma. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's definitely <laughs> pharma now. But, uh, you know, we were there in some heady years, and this ecosystem is now led you know, by, by Josh, but there's 20 other biotech CEOs who were in fairly senior roles. So. Uh, exactly the yeah. point. You're you're within this uh, uh, diaspora, this uh, cradle, this call it what you will. Um, but once you start to make those connections, it's a it's it's a good environment to be in for sure. And and uh, just be careful because everybody remembers you. But it's uh, <laughs> it's also uh, it's also very welcoming and and uh, mm -hmm. so many talented people. So I'm going to shift gears in a second. But Jake, did you want to add something? Uh, if I did, I forgot what it was. Good. So <laughs> Good. Um, okay. So you said something interesting, Eric, that I want to pick on for a second. Um, I was at a conversation. Maybe some of you were there not too long ago. Uh, Dr. Lee presented on his work at WashU on um, uh, uh, all the different things he's doing uh, in stroke and other areas. This is fascinating. And I will. The cool thing was he put this slide up on NIH funding, and WashU is number one there right now. That's mm. awesome. <laughs> and um, but the question though runs at odds. A little, or could perceptively with what we're talking about here, which is, well, then don't do a postdoc, don't do, you know, and, and by the way, you're not the only one who feels that way. So the question really is, um, are we in danger in the U.S. of, of basically too many people give, giving up is the wrong word, but switching to industry, switching to what we're talking about up here, and are we going to find ourselves 20 years from now having a gap in the basic biology that's happening? Just to be provocative, I mean, do we have to be having a different conversation with some of our rising stars coming out of places like WashU? Um, because everybody in this place is presumably not going back into academia, right? So we're relying on that future as well. And so just that was one of the questions. And I'm, I'm curious, what is, what's the other side of that argument and getting people to stay? And, ha and how do you think about that? Who should stay, right? Like, how do we feel about that? It's a good question. I kind of think it's just normalizing a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I actually think, um, to Jake's point earlier, like, small biotechs do actually do, re they do research. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. contribute to that, that ecosystem, um, and they publish, and they, like, have breakthroughs, and they invent, and all of those kinds of things, um, just with a different focus in a different way. Um, my sense is that the pipeline for academia was overflowing. Um, and so, you know, like, as long as we don't go too far the other way, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I think is your point, you know, I think it, it yeah. could, I don't know. I know, I absolutely agree. Um, I, I don't think that there's less people getting PhDs. I think there's less no. people doing postdocs. Mm -hmm. And postdocs are staying for shorter periods of time because they get yanked out into biotech. And that's a really good thing because Postdocs are the most underpaid people in our industry relative to their skill set and capabilities. And the only reason to do postdoc is not to gain more skill sets and capabilities unless you want to go into academia, because mm -hmm. you can gain the exact same ones inside of a, a biotech. It's just to pad your CV to get that academic job. So I don't lament the decrease in postdocs at all. I think it's, it's probably a healthy thing, as Molly said, for the industry. Mm -hmm. And I think we're just going to have you know, the same, if not more, PhDs with increased NIH funding over time, which we need, because that PhD is critical critical skill set in, in many cases. Yep. Good. Yeah, I think the people who are going to stay in academia are going to be a good fit for that, and they're going to see that life, and they're going to want that life. And you know, there are advantages of, of living that life and doing those things. And um, I don't think it's going to go away. It's less, but I think it's mostly less for good reasons. And um, I, the pendulum is swinging. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think it's going to go too far. And even if it does, I think it'll come back. Good. OK, so we'll shift gears again to the, another fun topic, which is something, Molly, I think you'll will pine on, which is AI and biotech. And it's a hot area. We're reading all about it. But um, let's, let's talk about that a little bit and, and how we're all thinking about that for our respective companies. And is that the future of biotech? Or is it, or is it 
part of biotech, right? And, and I think there's so much happening there right now, and that's another question we got from people. And so we'll start with you, Molly, because I think you're well positioned to comment on it. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. I think um, there's very different viewpoints on this from the perspective that AI is a tool just like every other tool that we have in the lab. Um, and all the way to if your company isn't built on machine learning, you won't succeed. Like there's, there is like that entire spectrum, and it's probably somewhere in the middle, um, as is usually the answer to these types of questions. Um, I think there are some un uniquenesses to the the tool. I think it actually is a little bit more foundational than um, even some of the bioinformatics type tools that we've seen in the past. I think there's some kind of fundamental changes that don't just like augment what you already do; they change what you do and they change the way that you do it. Um, and so I think there's like, there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of shifts over the next few years in how AI is used in the labs. Um, and I also think just how it's used in companies broadly. To be honest, like as you start to build these biotechs, one of the things that, that as they start to get bigger, you realize is that much of the inefficiency actually isn't in the science. <laughs> it's in all of these other things that you're doing as a company. Um, it's in your HR system, it's in your finance, it's in you know like everything it takes to run a company. I think AI is gonna wipe that stuff out like quickly. And then you know we're gonna, if we can get more efficient there, I think you're gonna start to see more efficiencies also in, in the science. But I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be broad. Um, and it's there's a there's a part of people ask a lot of a lot of times do I just do I need to be an expert in this? I think the reality is is that you have to understand it. You have to understand how it's being used. I don't think we're gonna. I don't think that everyone needs to be an ML scientist. Just like everyone doesn't need to be a CFO. <laughs> like <laughs> so uh, so I think there's gonna be a lot of things that we can't uh -huh. can't predict and a lot of things that are gonna look different in the future. Or if you know if you don't understand it and you're like me and lucky enough to sit next to Molly every day, <laughs> then you can just rely upon her to keep you informed. Yeah, I'm I'm more like Jake, um, and <laughs> that I only sit next to people who understand it. Um, I, I'm also probably, as you might guess, on on Molly's nicely explained spectrum of you're dead if you don't do it versus it's another <laughs> tool. I'm more on the it's another tool side and maybe that's because I'm a skeptical scientist person by nature. Um, I will say that I find it astonishing what AI can do in all walks of life and in science uh, as part of that. And I will tell you that even at Mosaic, while we do take advantage of it to some degree, not anywhere near to the degree that, that Generate does, we have already found things that I believe we would not have found not using it. You can generate so much information now with the technologies that we have for scientific uh, testing that you get databases of information that are impossible to inspect, quote, quote unquote, by eye, if you will. You, there's just too much there to, to process by the human brain. And the only way to do it is with advanced computing and, and AI, and as a result, you can find the needle in the haystack much more likely with that than you, in my opinion, would have ever had a chance um, by doing it by old school methods that I grew up with. So let me, let me ask, a, let me ask, I know this is your show, but let me ask a slightly <laughs> different question. The less um, questions I've asked, yeah. the better for me. <laughs> so, um, and by the way, thanks for wiping out all the G&A jobs. So, um, but, but in all seriousness, there is a lot of um, fear out there being largely created by big tech that is, you know, getting up in front of Congress and saying, yeah, this is going to, you know, we're going to have you know, the machines running the world. And there's got to be, and my parents are pretty freaked out right now. Um, <laughs> how do you make sure that that message gets moderated so that uh, the government doesn't come in and say, well, actually, we need to, we need to manage this? Yeah, it's yeah, a good question. I mean, like, for me, I've been thinking about what am I, what am I actually scared of? Because, mm -hmm. um, 
One of the things that has been fascinating to me about this is that oftentimes when there's that type of fear in like a community, um, you have like those people who are just, you know, fairly rational, like kind of calming everyone down. The interesting thing that I see here is that like some of the most rational people I know and like most well educated and like thoughtful future thinkers are also scared. Mm -hmm. And that to me, I'm like, oh, this feels this feels different. Something about this feels different. So um, like reflecting on what is it that feels different about it. And I think like to me, what, what I've realized is that previously when we were afraid of a technology, um, you know, we had physical control over it. Like, you know, nuclear bomb, like you, you can isolate it and everyone around can see that you've isolated it and a co another country can at least inspect in some way that you've done that and that you have protections. This, there's nothing like that. And people don't understand it, they can't see it, they can't feel it, they can't touch it. Um, and so they think it's doing something that they don't, they don't know. And there is, there, is a, there is one part of that, but I'd say the, the, it's no different in the sense that probably the most dangerous thing about AI are bad people doing bad things, just like any other technology. Just like, you know, any type of recombinant DNA that we might be trying <laughs> to protect from, you know, like. That's the perfect analogy. It's Is bad that... people doing bad things. Yeah. Um, and so I think like, there is a role for government to figure out how do, you, how, do you, how do you put those right procedures in place so that we, we understand how to protect against those things, but not stop innovation, not stop movement, because you're not going to stop it. Like, there's no way that we're going to stop it. So not to give away state secrets, but are, up at Generator, are you thinking about, okay, what is our policy? Uh, a lot. Yeah. Um, very, I mean, it's, it's a huge part. It's, it's also one of the things that all of these tech companies need to be thinking about. Yeah is secure, security from an IT perspective. Because as soon as you start to get advanced technology like that, it's no different than any other technology. Um, and having, again, bad people do bad things um, and, and come in. So I think there's, just from a like, just raw security perspective, how do you make sure that people can't get access to the tools that you're building yep. and the technologies you're building? Yep. So I think it's a huge, a huge challenge. Um, I don't have an answer to it. I don't know that anybody does. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll be showing a clip on Terminator here. And, and, <laughs> you know what? You know we will find a solution to this, just like we found a, a solution to when and how are you allowed to play with DNA and exactly. genes, mm -hmm. um, which was more what I lived through. Um, this is just the next thing that people are worried about, and there's going to be another thing after this. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but, but you also think about how drugs have been developed forever and the assays and then just the time that it takes. I mean, this is spectacularly efficient and, and interesting it, and, and differentiating. And, and it's just, it's going to change everything. It's just. You know. It is. And the problems that we're trying to solve now in medicine are far more complex than what we dared try to solve even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, there were only certain things we could do. There was a time when no one could make a protein to make an antibody therapy or a replacement protein. It was just not physically possible. The technology wasn't there, but it came. And so now with these more advanced technologies in AI, we're gonna solve more complicated problems and diseases that were perceived to be completely untreatable are now going to become potentially Absolutely. treatable. Right, so one of the cool things about AI and biotech is we're at the beginning of this S curve where compute is starting to really influence biology in a way that you know we started with sequencing the human genome and it's been a very slow ramp, but it is really taking off with companies like Generate and, and I'm sure many of you have heard of AlphaFold and the ability to actually just solve the structure of a protein. And for those of you in the crowd who are, I'll call you bio-curious, you may not be in biology, but you're wondering if maybe it's something you should get involved with. Um, to actually realize that, we're going to need people who are canonically mechanical engineers, automation engineers, and material scientists to really see that S-curve come to fruition soon, too. That's a good point.
point. Um, so not to continue to take us down this path of doomsday, but um, there is a question about, which I think is a good one, uh, what, are the, what is the biggest challenge facing biotech right now? Um, there is all kinds of things in the news, right? Um, and and this, this could be one, but I think it's worthwhile to talk about. Um, and then we'll, we'll flip back to something more positive. But I do think it's, it's important because actually, flip it on its head, understanding where the biggest pain points are are also things to think about for careers as well and where you want to be actually orienting yourself because trying to, you know, actually in, um, when you're an operator and you're a CEO of a private company, you get told no a lot, so get used to it. That, that's, that's a very <laughs> important skill set um, and to not take it personal. But one of the things you learn very quickly with any investor is what's the problem I'm solving? Why should you care? And how important is it, right? Well, I'm going I'm to throw, so, throw one out that is actually probably going to be a little provocative, but okay. it's ignorance. The biggest issue we have in this country is, I mean, we, Fauci showed it. So my full disclosure, my son just graduated from WashU. He, uh, you know, Fauci showed up at the graduation. Uh, most people stood up. Uh, to applaud, which felt pretty good about. Um, but there were protesters in Clayton uh, where he was staying. And that's uh, a blight on this industry. It's a blight on society. It's a blight on the contributions of everybody who's uh, got us through the last few years. And uh, it's an embarrassment. And so uh, the mere appreciation for what these guys are doing uh, is uh, lost in rhetoric and uh, silliness. And I don't know how you get through that when you have uh, leaders who don't believe in uh, science. And until that changes, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you, I don't know how you fix things. You're just gonna have more and more fear. So. Okay. I mean, there's, so. a, there's an aspect there's of, <laughs> of, I think there's, yeah, I mean, there's so many examples over the course of many years where science has solved problems in, in amazing ways. I remember when I was coming out of my post talking about to start the industry and working on HIV, and people died of HIV. And they die of it now, too, but, like, not much longer, right. not right. much earlier than they would die anyway. Right. And, I mean, those therapies changed the world uh, right. in, a, in a lot of amazing ways. And now, you know, curative therapies for all sorts of things um, are, are starting to, to come out. And so you just look at, you know, Fauci getting, like, how fast was it? Like a, a year, year and a half, we had a vaccine ready um, for, for, for treating COVID, you know? And, but somehow he's villainized for this in, in ways that I don't, I don't really understand when we actually, we actually solve the problem in, it can't even say record time. It's like beyond even imaginable record. And if you look at what science has done, and yet we seem not to get credit for it when we do it, it's never good enough, right? And I wonder whether there's an aspect to this, which is maybe coming back to one of your earlier points, Jason, which is, you know, what happens with companies and ideas and building companies is that there's sometimes this irrational exuberance that we've gotten so good at selling the concept, the vision of where we want to be and the path there, that you know when it doesn't happen and people have put a lot of money in and it doesn't go well, you know you you get dinged for that. And even if there's ten or twenty or a hundred things that you've done right, you get hurt way more by the one that that didn't go well. And so I wonder if that's part of the problem in, in biotech is that we're capable of creating irrational exuberance, um, which can be good because when it does work, it works fast because people put money in it. But when it doesn't work, we get villainized. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll comment for a second and let Molly and Jake comment too, just to, at a different point of view, not on that, but just the question I asked, which is for me, I've thought about um, Biotech, so if you, if you read The Emperor of Maladies, right, the book about cancer, what, one of the ahas for me was it was very incremental. But over time, if you look at it, it's a magnitude shift, right? It's almost like if you look at the S&P in a six-month period during a dip, you're like, oh, my God. Look at it over 10 years, and it actually just goes like this, right? And so 
in lots of diseases, MS and cancer and multiple sclerosis, it's incremental. It's important, but y you make a breakthrough, a drug, and then improvement, improvement, improvement. Next thing, you know, HIV is a wonderful example. I mean, where we are today is unbelievable. Um, and most, most diseases work that way. What happened with the vaccine was really incredible, although the, a lot of money went into Moderna, but still the amount of speed and no incrementalism to, to get to, there's very few examples like that. I think hep, hep B or C with Gilead and Pharmacet yeah. was another one, yeah. but it's so few and far between. So, and the reason that my biggest concern for biotech is, unfortunately, the cost to make a drug have only gone up. So it's still the case that being successful, I think from the beginning is three to 5%. It still takes seven to 10 years if you're lucky, and it still costs over a billion dollars. And I think a lot of the companies were technologies we're talking about today, beyond, it, it, to me, it's all about uh, cash is your most precious asset, time is your most valuable asset, but all, ultimately it's about probability of success. And so what I worry about is all these things are incredible. They may lead to solving diseases, but if the cost and the time still goes up, we've got a major challenge in front of us. So hopefully what I think really the problem that we should be trying to solve for is probability of success. Because you're right the first time, if, even if it takes longer, you can start to do things more efficiently. And, but that to me is something that I think is really important and a challenge that I worry about from a cost and time perspective. Um, just add a different element to it, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna agree. I mean, kind of combining the two points, like I think that that's, to me there's a, there's a challenge with public perception, which I think goes to like ignorance or just like, you know, you only see what you see. Mm -hmm. You only see what you, know, you see on the news, which is the price of insulin is too high, <laughs> right? But you don't understand, you know, that that's like one very specific example out of like all you know drugs that are life changing, um, and it all comes down to the fact that people don't understand what you just described. That most drugs fail, and in order to be able to be successful as as a, mm -hmm. as a company, you have to for every drug that's successful account for all the drugs that you didn't that weren't successful, and you know I. I I don't know how many people saw uh, like Stefan's uh, testimony for, for the vaccine. It was really interesting to hear him talk. I mean, I think he did a great job of describing why things are priced the way they are. But you can say it incredibly crisply, incredibly clearly in like very like, you don't have to be a finance major to understand like these types of like supply and demand conversations and how you know, when the government supports things, you know, you can, you can take a little bit of a hit. And people are emotional. They're just, they're just emotional, you know, for various reasons. And uh, they, just, they just want things to be cheaper. They chalk it up to greed and all those things. When it's really like, as an industry, we need to get better at bringing success rates down, bringing cost rates down, cost of developing drugs down. And that is hard. Um, that is really, really hard. And so I think it's like these, almost your two points combined mm. that like really get, like kind of lead to the biggest problem in my mind. Wait, where? Couldn't, couldn't agree more. The only thing I'll add is it's not just biotech, it's not just pharma. Our healthcare system mm. in general yeah. in the United States is extremely expensive and we get wrapped up in all that. And for some reason, I think villainized more than the rest of the healthcare system, yeah. but we're, we're not alone in that regard at all. Yeah, totally. I, I wonder whether, I, I really like what, what both of you just said and um, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, we've got this problem of people not understanding what we do and how much it takes and the, the 20 to 1 failure to, that you have to pay for to get the one that succeeds. And I just wonder whether, you know, we're here, you know, supporting and representing Washington University. Is education something we could leverage better than we do to make sure the general population, whether they go to college or not, does understand these kinds of things so they are more sensible about it. Yeah. yeah. I agree. By the way, uh, uh, one other point to build on that is the U.S. effectively subsidizes the rest of the world yeah. for drug discovery and development. It, yeah. it, and if you just look at drug prices, yeah. The rest of the world is disproportionately, I mean, we, you give the vaccine away for free in some places, disproportionately lower for every drug, which effectively means that taxpayers and investors and private and public are subsidizing the rest of the world for drug Just discovery. Just as development, case in is, point, I, uh, I got COVID thing. recently when I was in France, and the cost of a course of Paxlovid for my wife and I was six euros. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that that was made here. Yeah. And and I mean, even today, a new drug gets priced. Let's say it's a rare disease drug priced at five hundred thousand. It shall not be priced at five hundred thousand in European countries. In fact, it may be priced fifty thousand in some countries. And so, yeah. it's a very interesting problem that we've set ourselves up for. And it's I think for being the privilege of being the United States of America. But it, other countries are catching up, and it's it's creating a really interesting dynamic. Um, so I'm conscious of time, and maybe I'll end on one question, and then we'll open it up to the group if there's questions. But that last question, if I could have it, was just really the best advice you guys would offer newly graduating students. Um, and so, Jacob, maybe we'll start at the end. We'll start with you, and we'll go back this way. Um, figure out what it is you truly want to do, what makes you the most happy. Ask yourself what gives you energy, what draws energy for you, from you, and go out and seek a job that allows you to do that. And this is something probably each of you guys knows well. The surest way to uh, find a great fit for an employee that you bring onto your team for a new teammate is match their interests with the company's needs. And so if you're just going out there trying to match, you're eventually going to find something that really clicks. And that's going to be the place that you're going you're gonna to be the happiest, you're going to grow the fastest, and you're going to learn the most. And that's ultimately the most important thing for the first thing that you do. Uh, the advice I gave my just graduated son was don't come home. Uh, <laughs> out of the house as long as, no, uh, you know, I, look, everybody, everybody will ask you about uh, following your passion. I would, I would not focus on following your passion. You'll catch up to your passion at some point. Uh, do what's interesting to you. Do, you know, try new things. Be, you know, I, I've had a lot of different gigs uh, over the years. And, uh, you know, that, and, and by the way, go into the office because that first group of friends that you make are going to be your friends forever. It's a crazy thing. So if you're just remote or you're not going in, you're not going to make those friends. And, and that's, that's a miss. So I think that's my, that's my big advice. Yeah, go, go into the office at least a couple of days. So. Um, I think contrary to the, the <laughs> point of the panel, but uh, <laughs> I, I think ultimately, like, seek advice, but trust yourself. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, you know what's going to be best for you. Um, and if you listen, if you try to listen to everyone, you're, you're not going to find an answer. Um, so take it in and process it, but process it through your own lens and trust, trust your instincts, trust where you're going and, and you know, follow, follow what, what really is best for you. I, I think those are all really great points. Maybe one thing I, I could add is that you know, it's natural to want to see yourself advancing and, 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 and growing and, and gaining influence and, and power and trying to figure out ways to do that. And I guess my advice would be don't try and figure out how to do that. Go to a company, work hard for that company, try and do everything you can to make that company the team that you're on successful because it's very unlikely you're going to be working on your own. And your career will get taken care of if you do that. If you ignore yourself and work for the company and for the team, you will do very well. That's wonderful advice from all four of you. So um, with that, we'll open it up to any questions that you all may have. But again, I'll just thank the panelists for spending their time with us and giving great answers. So thank you very much. This is that uncomfortable moment when you have to have an icebreaker. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, this question's for Eric because earlier he mentioned something about biotech being like the ivory tower, the place where people can run with their ideas and stuff. Do you think that applies to industry in general or if or is there something specific about biotech that makes it separate? And if so, what is that thing that sets it apart from other industry? Or is it just the case that generally industry now is the place to go instead of academia to run with our ideas, like you were saying? It's a, it's a good question. I, I, I could see giving multiple answers to this, but I, I think there's space for innovation in every industry. Some choose to exercise that and, and maybe keep pace and, and stay in existence, and, and some don't, and maybe they go by the, the wayside. Um, I do think that biotech is exceptional in this regard. I don't think it's the only one. I think Jake made the point that 
maybe we were late to the game and that the tech people were way ahead of us. Um, but I do think biotech is special in that regard and in particular in that regard. Um, so I hope that answers your, your question. Oh, what makes it special? <laughs> well, the, the thing is many companies that exist um, exist to provide a specific service. And there can be innovation in providing that service that can make it better. But, but biotech is about creating things that don't exist. To have a vision for a future where people are healthier for some reason or another, and that there's a way to get there. And that's, that's a different level of innovation and, and really almost a sole focus on innovation as opposed to delivering a product. Both industries are completely necessary and, and, and are important to our survival. But biotech is about having a vision for a future that we're not at yet and therefore requires that ivory tower kind of ap approach to get there. I'll give you a financial point of view, which is not just, which is kind of interesting about what makes it unique as well. So the thing about biotech, which is kind of fascinating, is um, generally speaking, when markets are down, every, you know, most things get pulled down with them. Interestingly, although biotech is down, if you have a positive data readout, if you have, to, to Eric's point, if you're, if you're making something that will help people and will create value and solve a problem, um, you will actually inflect differently from what the market is doing. You'll, you'll be alpha to the market. And that's very unique, actually, as an industry. The other aspect to that is, I think, biotech is a very funny industry in that the value of their products goes, one, to the patients. That, the patients themselves get the value from it, but the majority of value actually goes to the company if you commercialize a product. Where think about an iPhone. The majority of the value of the iPhone goes to the user, actually, if you, if you think about it. You use your iPhone way more than the $1,000 it costs you or whatever it is now. You get way more utility out of it than that. Whereas in biotech, if you spend all this money and you get there and whatnot, your company can go from, I mean, what's the most recent one? Theseus sold for $6 billion or, <laughs> or you know, you, you can go from a three, four, five hundred million company to $5 billion. And it's very unique in that sense from a financial perspective. And, and so that sets up for an interesting dynamic from a sort of where you spend your time and getting rewarded. So yes, the aspect of doing things that are doing well for patients and helping people is always there, but there's a very interesting financial dynamic to this as well, which I, I think is sort of very different from any other industry. Absolutely, and just to connect it back to that, the tech comment you made again and connecting with Josh said as well, in biotech and pharma in general, we know that if we make a certain product, it will sell. These patients have a disease, there's 10,000 of them, they have nothing for them today. If you can make that, you know that thing's gonna you know, sell a lot. The question is just, can you get there? And in tech, it's very different. You have no idea whether the product you're actually building is actually going to help the world. It probably won't help the world, because it's tech, but whether or not <laughs> anyone's gonna actually want it in the world. And um, so that kind of like, <laughs> that, that known market opportunity is I think something that a lot of people don't appreciate about biotech that's unique. I'm not sure of another industry where that's the case, except maybe in like large government contracts or something like mm -hmm. that. Anything else? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so given the backdrop of COVID uh, and, and maybe the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the recent rate hikes, uh, do you guys have any thoughts or uh, dangerous predictions for the next couple of years here? Uh, secret WashU alumni answers only. <laughs> <laughs> this for you? Jason, this is right up your yeah. alley. Yeah. Uh, so uh, markets are going to markets are going to stay. Up? They're going to. Well, they have up? to go back. They always go back up. Yeah. This is some Mr. Hockey stick perspective. Over there. They, they <laughs> but but it's going to it's going to be tight for a while. I mean, there's no you know people are really sitting on their cash right. And there's a ton of cash on this on the side of it. now. To Josh's point, there are, uh, you know, companies are getting funded, uh, but the the bar and where these companies are in their evolution is the real change. You're not, you know, sure, plenty of preclinical companies are getting funded, but VCs want to see things that are clinic ready. You know, they want to see things that have proof of concept. They, you know, the pie in the sky stuff is going to have a much harder time getting getting funded and that's that's just a reality and that's that's a good thing i mean that that's i've you know i yeah it's it's uh, it's a good thing 
was the other day. The, the thing that I've been surprised by actually is yeah. that I expected that pharma would be finding a lot of, of bargains, mm -hmm. um, but they still tend to be focused just on later stage assets. Mm -hmm. I would think they'd start investing, if not buying outright, if not partnering many programs for these pie in the sky companies that earlier they would never be interested in or they couldn't afford it. There'd be like a PE model where they just kind of roll them up, but there's, that hasn't, hasn't happened, happened either. Yeah, so it's, it's been surprising. Yeah, so I agree. Never a better time to start a company from the perspective of technology and, and science. Truly, this is a, an amazing, amazing time for all the things we've talked about today. It's unbelievable. I mean, the things you can do with gene editing, the things you can do with mRNA, the things you can do with AI. So truly, in, a, in an interesting, there's never a better time to start a company. It's just, to put it in a different way, the cost of capital is, net, is extremely high right now. So the way I think about that is um, you, just, you just might have to um, recognize that you're not gonna necessarily own as much of it as you want, or you're not gonna necessarily, you, you know, two, three years ago starting a company, you might have ended up owning more of it if you were the person starting it. But now the cost of capital is higher, meaning for all the reasons you said. So it's just a bit more expensive. Now, Jason's not wrong. There are companies that are in different positions. But I'm saying if you're starting a company now or getting going, never a better time. I mean, it's just, and, and you know, this is the interesting thing about markets like this is we all read it. We all know it, you know. Be greedy when others are fearful. Be fearful when others are greedy. And yet everybody is, finds it hard to do in the moment. But what I'd say is, you know, the best investors, the best company builders, they're heads down getting it done right now. And, and like, go and find those people. Because they're, they're getting, oper you know, those are, are great times. To, and you know what? The best, the best investments, by the way, and you would know this, Eric, were 2008 and 9. That's when people became rich. Because you know what? Cost of capital was high. People were investing in companies when they were, quite frankly, at par value or lower, and they made a ton of money out of them because they were good companies. So don't confuse the fact of high cost of capital and tough markets with really good things happening and really valuable companies and assets. And companies are sort of at their best when they have to be scrappy. So I actually think it's, you know, there's opportunities here and quite a few, but it's not to confuse with the fact that it is true. It's a very hard time as well. And so you kind of, if you're asking me, the, the secret watch you handshake is like, find those scrappy companies too. Like those are the ones where you're gonna like figure out what you're made of. And those are the ones that end up building pretty impressive things. By the way, if you read any of these autobiographies of these, you know, whether it's Shoe Dog and Phil Knight or any of that, these guys almost went on a business five times over, right? These are, biotech's not unique in that. And so I actually think it's a really neat time and to get involved, especially if you're coming out where you can take these risks and actually see what, how these companies fight through this stuff. So there's a, optimistic point of view on it. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. Um, I've lived in Boston a long time, and I've become kind of selfish of the fact that Boston has become the capital of biotech. I remember before COVID, many, many more overt attempts by other regions of the country to try to get biotech companies to move because they saw what a great value they become for Boston. I don't seem to see that anymore. I'm curious whether you feel that that's true. There's less pull to bring your companies or other things to other parts of the country to try to build another biotech hub. Mm. I don't think there's a pull per se. I think we're more like a role model. Um, I think other regions are trying to build biotech and I think there's a recognition that this is an important industry, it's here to stay, and that there's room for it in more places than Boston. But I don't, well, I mean, I could be stupid and bold and say that we will never be displaced. And, and I honestly believe that to be true because this has a very special ecosystem here of universities um, and hospitals and uh, venture capitalists and big pharma all in the same place intermingling. There's no place like it on the planet. And I don't, I don't know how easy it would be to replicate it. The closest thing to it is arguably, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area. There was a time when they had exceeded us and displaced us from the leadership role. But since then, it's been a role reversal that, that I don't see re-rolling. <laughs> And reversing. It's I just my most, bold. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. I, yeah. I think most companies are also fighting the like bringing people back to work still uh -huh. conversation. Like, if you look at even many, I'm sure, generally was like this, I'm sure many companies are like this. During the pandemic, we hired 
so many more remote employees, and we're now in this place where like that that seems like a good idea. <laughs> and some roles are, are okay being remote, but not all, and not all the roles that we've we've hired. And so I think there's probably you know we might see a little bit more of a swing back once people realize that like being remote and being all over the world isn't isn't necessarily going to build the best company. Um, and like we saw that like people moved to wherever they wanted to throughout the country uh, during the pandemic. So it's probably it's probably a little bit of an artificial component there too that, that might just come back a little bit once we all are in person again. Yeah, yeah I, I think the only thing I'd observe is um, I agree that we have a special anchor here with the universities and that there's, there's something unique about that. But I also think the way to change that too that can happen at times is companies. So there was a company called Human Genome Sciences, it was um, Maryland, I believe, yeah, and yeah. they were getting big for a while. Um, and that was creating a lot of energy, and they got bought. And then that, that was the end of it. Um, and um, there are other examples like that. And if you think about it, Genentech, I think, was part of that rise, and they yeah. got bought by Roe, and they, you know, there's still a lot there. But um, part of it is, I think, when if you can create a very successful company that can hire thousands of people, that can create a sort of, they can also create that kind of energy and whatnot. Um, Eli Lilly has that in Indianapolis. There's football in Eli Lilly. And, um, and, and that's kind of what they, well, when Peyton left, there's just Eli Lilly. And, and so, <laughs> Aren't like, the Pacers you know, there as well? What's that? Aren't there the Pacers as well? Yeah, yeah. And, um, <laughs> but, I, but I do think that's part of it too, is like successful companies. And for, for the reasons that build on themselves, they tend to be in these same places. But, you know, it will be, to your point, Eric, like there'll be a company that will break through that. And it might be in Texas or it might be here. And, th and that will change the dynamic, I think. That will bring people there if it's a special enough company and that will help. But we also have the universities to fall back on. And I think that also is unique. So I agree on that. Uh, what's the industry-wide perception or perceptions of Andrew Lowe's, uh, I guess, how to cure cancer or financial engineering idea. The, basically, that idea is um, index, when you're investing in a variety of different biotech, mm -hmm. you know, pharmaceutical effort, research efforts, you can just put them in a mega fund. How does the industry perceive that? Or any, are there any efforts being made to actually implement that? Well, that was a bit of what Bridge Bio was um, with Andrew, right? There's a company that he's part of that is in a sense was a bit of that. And um, I think that on one hand, they're, they're able to make drugs. On the other hand, they made some financial errors, I would say, in terms of when they raised debt at an all-time high and then the stock crashed. And I think they probably wish they had that one back. But that's OK. Like, anybody could make that mistake. Um, I think the entire theory of it, right, was cost of capital related, right? Was, was sort of if you raise a fund of, there was a rare disease one and an oncology one. And it was an interesting idea and still is an interesting idea. But I think rare disease was $3 billion, uh, oncology was $30 billion, And you have different structures of debt. And it was almost like what you created with different tiers of selling mortgage-backed securities, in a sense. That's how I thought about it. Um, and so I think on one hand, the general notion of finding different ways to bring different capital into the ecosystem to fund more is a good idea that Andrew brings to the table. Um, I think there's a lot of built-in assumptions that come back to probability of success and correlation of success that still make that cost of capital pretty high. So I think Andrew's model is good from the perspective of um, how do we get different types of vehicles to put money in besides just venture capital? Because it is true in our industry, we do have a disconnect between um, the amount of good ideas the amount of financings and look what's happening now, what Jason was alluding to, there's just not, the capital's kind of, it's, it's inefficient right now. It's, it's sort of not flowing in all the right places. Um, and debt is not a vehicle that heavily gets used in biotech, especially when there's not revenue. So the interesting thing about what Andrew was trying to do is how can we bring debt to earlier, more risky things in a way where people can still make money? And that's a good idea, I think. It's just, I think it's complicated by the fact that biotech fundamentally is still highly risky. And it's what we said, make one drug, lose 10 drugs. So that, that's my view of kind of the concepts, a good one to keep building on. But I think that there's just fundamental challenges that are out of beyond just the financial model question. But the, the, only, the only problem with the debt model now is it's just with interest. It's it's 
so out of whack right now. So yeah. for companies to take that on at this point is 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 it's just a big yeah. you know you just have you just have to say look if we don't do this you know this is our only option but it's got to be like a last resort yeah. kind of we, thing. We right? try to solve that at, at flagship in a uh -huh. slightly different way, which is we have a lot of startups, but collectively we've we've strong purchasing power, whereas any individual one of these companies would have very poor purchasing power. So we see that in the types of rates we mm -hmm. get for loans. We see it in purchasing equipment and deals yeah, we get in real good. estate, yeah. like this place, right? Yeah, that's huge. Right. Um, so that, that can make a big difference in, in this environment. That, that's a good point, actually. So a lot of the biotechs, one of, one of the challenges we have, which is kind of interesting, you're, you're hitting around the head, is uh, during these hot years, the go-go years, the real estate became very expensive. And when you raise like 50 million, 100 million, and you look and you find that each year you're spending five million just to be in a building, it doesn't feel great. And, th and that you're exactly right. And so using debt to offset things like equipment and that and, or is a very smart thing to do, I agree. So I think that the more you can find ways to kind of bring different vehicles to finances, that's, that's a great point on that. Well, and you've all the other guys too investing now in later stage assets with companies who can't get them across the finish line. Yeah. So they're gonna, you know, they'll, they'll fund a phase two that has promise and hopefully get it, you know, get it uh, to a point where you know it can complete clinical studies, and they'll they'll take royalties off the marketed product. But that's you know again, these are. I did have a solution to this, which is uh, the Wash U uh, endowment. Use yeah. Their money to back entrepreneurs. <laughs> that's doing well for Wash U. It's doing well for patients, and I haven't quite convinced them of that. But yet. I think but, we, uh, have to, <laughs> we have to disclose Wash U is an LP at flagship. Isn't hey, it? So, <laughs> so there you go. So uh, that's right. Uh, I guess a bit of a pushback or maybe a bit of optimism to some of the things you were talking about, Josh, in terms of the failure rate of taking drugs to actual commercial to market. Yeah. Um, it, perhaps it's the opportunity for us, and I think you alluded to this, with technology, we're used to this lean concept of try, fail, pivot, continue yeah. to do that. Is, is there such opportunity? I mean, I'm looking at Generate Bio with computer intelligence yeah. and in silico or you know other capabilities and technology to actually improve the the rate by which you're taking drugs to through clinical trials and then you know approval and all that is there a bit of optimism perhaps oh, to I, be had? I I sure think so and I, these guys should comment much more yes uh, you, you got yes like I think that's entirely right and I think that's the biggest some of the biggest promises not just curing new diseases but exactly that and so yeah, I'm very optimistic about mm -hmm. that yeah, I think that's like that, that's the point. Is like that's one of the biggest challenges that we can solve. Is if we can make the probability of success higher from the beginning, um, you know, you can solve some of these cost challenges. You can solve some of these perception challenges. Like that's that is the root that we have to we have to be focused on as an industry. I think that I think that's right. And just as another example, another flagship company, Valo Health, you know, is really based on on that on that premise, you know, finding a more efficient way using AI and the types of things to make sure you make better decisions along the way. And I, I think there has to be that as part of the, the future. I think another thing, and maybe this is my shameless promotion, but I, I think that the world is going to move to a place where you don't have to build it all yourself, that you can work with external organizations that are really good at things and um, especially um, all phases of, of drug development where there are p companies that are really good at doing the things that you do need to do. You need to provide the strategic advice a lot of times or you need to come up with a biological idea, but you don't have to build the whole thing yourself. You can use existing resources in the world that can help you implement those things in a more cost-effective way. Sort of a mosaic of capabilities. Yes. <laughs> I am very conscious of time. I'm one minute over. Um, thank the panelists again. Thank our generously our WashU hosts for putting this together. And uh, thank you, everybody, for the good questions. We appreciate it.